Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network. On today's show, I got to talk about it, people. Deion Sanders is now a Colorado Buffalo, and I'm fine with that. He left the HBCU. We could talk about that. It's not really, that's not my problem. I'm, I'm good with that. Go get the money, bro. But this swaggiest list he came out with, and not him. We know somebody put this out there. He posted it, though, because Deion Sanders was listed as the number one swaggiest coach. But then when you find out where P.J. Fleck lands, there's something that, something about that list that just doesn't sit right with me, and we'll discuss that next on the Ryan Johnson Show. Locked on Sports Minnesota Podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey everyone, welcome to the Ron Johnson Show. It's a beautiful, beautiful Tuesday. No snow yet, but I heard the snow is coming for those in Minnesota, for those other places, Florida, Texas, wherever you're at, you're lucky. You don't have to deal with what we're dealing with. But I have to jump into this college football conversation. As I mentioned, Deion Sanders has now vacated and moved on to the Colorado Buffalo, somewhere to the, to the upwards of $5 million a year. He's worth it. Look at the transfer portal. Look at what's going on. Everybody wants to be a part of Prime Time's team. I probably would too. Prime is about to bring it. His son at quarterback. I know his son wants to throw the ball. If I'm a receiver, I get it. But everybody can't go there. But that's not my problem right now. That's not what I want to talk about today. That's not my issue. But before I jump into my issue with this swaggiest list, I guess you want to call it, I want everybody to remember Amazon Fire and Roku. You can download the Locked On Sports Minnesota Podcast Network app. Just search Locked On Sports Minnesota on your Roku or your Amazon Fire device. It'll be right there on your TV. Add it to your queue. Now you can watch all of our shows, all of our videos, every day of the week. You can even see Luke Braun try to make something up about Kirk Cousins. Good luck, Luke. But before we jump into this show, before we get into the show, I got to bring Sam Ekstrom in, my producer. Mm -hmm. Sam, there's a list going around right now. The swaggiest list. We'll bring it up here. The swaggiest coaches from the most swaggiest to the least. And I think they only did about 50. No, 25. Sorry, 50. Mm -hmm. So 25 swagger and then 25 least swagger. Now, the one thing I think they did get right, Kirk Ferentz. He has no swag. We know that. Now, Brian Kelly, LSU, I don't know if I would say he has, like, he's a little swaggy to me. Like, yeah, I know he's a little older. Brian Kelly got, got something to him. Chip Kelly at UCLA, I don't agree with that. Dabo Sweeney, I think this is a hater. Like, the person that did this list is a hater. Like, when, you, when you're looking at the names, like Lincoln Riley, Lee Swagger, like, come on. Come on now. Like, this is, this is just a hater list. But that's not my Pat problem. Pat Fitzgerald? That's not, I love Pat Fitzgerald. Right. Like, that's, that's not my problem. Here's my problem. When you look at P.J. Fleck, so you go through the names of swaggier, swagger, sorry, let's go swaggiest coaches. Deion Sanders, Lane Kiffin, Shane Beamer, Marcus Freeman, definitely Marcus Freeman got the swag. Nick Saban, it's just Nick Saban, so you got to do it. Gus Malzahn, I don't know. Mel Tucker, yeah, Mel's coming. He's got a little swag to him, but then we get to that guy right there. You got Mike Leach, love Mike Leach. Rest in peace, by the way. For those that don't know, Mike Leach passed away, I think, last night or this morning in the hospital after being hospitalized, uh, age of 61. Uh, so rest in peace to Mike Leach. Uh, we lost a great one. Mike Leach was one of the greatest uh, coaches, you know, came up with a lot of these passing games, the air raid, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about the story, but rest in peace to Mike Leach. That's a tough one. But then you go to Brett Bilma. And I don't know if you've ever seen Brett Bilma get dressed for a game, get dressed for a game, and be dressed at the game. But there's no way. Now, Jim Harbaugh and his khakis, I get it. He's at Michigan. James Franklin. I get it. Steve Sarkeesian, eh, I don't know about that one. Luke Fickle, I can get it. I, I can roll with it. But P.J. Fleck, 
Have you seen the suits this dude puts on? Have you heard him talk? Like, come on, people. Come on. Like, there's no way P.J. Flex should be behind Brett Bielma. No way whatsoever. And and Sam, like, what are your thoughts? I mean, I, I know, I know, Sam. I see you come to the games, and, and you and you uh-huh. you got a little swag to it. But but what are your thoughts Mi- on that? Minimal. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, if we're going straight looks, straight superficial. I mean, I don't think Gus Malzahn and Nick Saban have a lot of swag. Frankly, they've got credibility. They don't have swag. They're older, kind of crotchety guys. PJ Fleck. Definitely, like some he might rub some people the wrong way. Some people might say he's a little cheesy, but he definitely mm-hmm. carries himself with more confidence and bravado, aka swagger, than some of those other guys on the list. He goes about things differently. He goes to the beat of his own drum, and uh, and I think that that equates to swagger. So if we're comparing him to Brett Bielema, yeah, that uh, the, the list throw the list out in my mind at that point. Um, because right. Bielema does not belong in the top 10, let alone the top 25. Um, he probably belongs on the other side of the board. And, and then, yeah, and so I get it. This is, this is all for fun. It, it's just fun stuff. There's no real way to quantify swag. It's all about one person's. I, you know what? I'm going to have to sit down and come my own list. We're going to have to, we have to release the uh, Locked On Sports, the Ron Johnson Show Swaggiest Coaches list. Like, I might have to sit down for a week or two and just come up with my own list and put it out there on Twitter and Instagram and let people talk about it. Because that's all Swaggiest that is. Swaggiest Locked just... On Sports personalities. Let's start with that. <laughs> we, we, had, we have to go through all of them, though. We'd have to go through every single. I don't know where Luke Brown would fall in that. Like, we'd, we'd have to go through all of it and see. Um, but no, we, we, we might have to come up with something for the coaches, maybe. Do our own. But I got mm-hmm. one more thing that, that kind of got to me. The All-American list came out. The AP All-American list came out. And again, another shot at P.J. Fleck and his Gophers. Now, not a real shot because um, John Michael Schmidt, we said this on the Locked On Sports Network, the Ron Johnson show for the entire season. John Michael Schmidt was the number one offensive interior lineman in the country, in my opinion. I said it from the start. Uh, I watched him last year. And uh, the kid was out, was outstanding. And then you watch him this year, same thing. Like you watch a lot of that that backside block, uh, that cut back by Mo Ibram. John Michael Schmidt was the guy. But we look at those running backs: Corum, Bijan Robinson. I get Robinson because he comes with a lot of hype at Texas. NIL out the door, out the yin yang. But Blake Blake Corum for me. Now people are gonna say, oh, he was hurt. If he wasn't hurt, he was. It. Mo's hurt too, and Mo played. Like you gotta go, you gotta give something to that as well. Like Mo has more than Blake. So if it's not statistics, is it just because I want I, like I, the eye test? Because people go, oh, the eye test, Blake. Cor-. You don't really know. Like you don't really know. Like I think Blake Corum, Michigan's offensive line is overall better than Minnesota's, but Mo Ibram is a better running back. I mean, he does have John Michael Schmidt, but Michigan has a few other better offensive linemen. Not not, not head and shoulders. Like, they're, they're, they're pretty even. But we know when you talk about NFL caliber, Michigan has it. Now, they did get Chuck Fili- Fili- uh, Filiaga to come to the Gophers from Michigan. Started this year, played great. But Mo making second-team All-American, and he made, made second-team All-American. Mm-hmm. Wasn't denied. Great kid. Um, I just feel like he should have been first team uh, over Blake Corum. And that's just me. B. John Robinson, I'm never going to say that. Like, yeah. the kid's good. He's explosive. Uh, you know, three down back, uh, at least in college. Who knows he's going to be in the NFL. But really good kid. Really, really good, explosive. But Mo to me should have been a little bit higher. Uh, but I don't know, Sam. Where do you fall on that one? Yeah. So Mo had more yards than both of them. Mo Correct. had one more touchdown than both of them. Yards per carry, those two had the advantage over Mo. But if if it's kind of a tie, I feel like you got to take into account that Mo was coming off an Achilles injury, and almost as a lifetime achievement award, I think he deserved right. to get first team All American. I mean, he set basically right. every Gophers rushing record, and I know that's not necessarily part of it, but yards and touchdowns. I mean, those are sort of the two of the big three statistics. Uh, I'm I'm surprised, frankly, that he didn't get it. Um, and you know, imagine if did he miss one game, Ron? If he didn't miss the one game, 
Purdue, um, then yeah. I think his stats would his stats would be so far above that he probably would have gotten that first team, which is a shame. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, second team's not bad. I think he's got an NFL future ahead of him, probably a mid round pick, and uh, and you know he'll uh, he'll make some dough in the NFL. And this is that's the one thing you know people are going to always go back to when you look at the stats. Now, I don't I didn't see the second team list, um, but I know. Another one, Chase Brown from Illinois. Like that's the one that people are saying Chase Brown is better than Mo because he's faster, uh, a little bit more explosive. They're all just different backs. They all bring different things to a team. Uh, but but you're right. You know, Mo at 1594, Chase Brown had 1642. So they can argue, well, why isn't Chase Brown first team? You have that argument. You can make that argument. No, no doubt. No doubt. But Mo did have more rushing yards than B. John Robinson. Uh, not by much, but that's that's the big key. Mo had 304 attempts. Bijan only had 258 carries. So that's a big difference for them to not, not be that far off. And so that one, you know, when you look at the 14-yard uh, splits them, but over 50, car- almost 50 carries difference, I could see that. Like Bijan Robinson, yeah, you can't deny that. But Blake Corum, I mean, 14-63, but only 247 carries. You know, so – there's there's an argument there, but that's that's just for me. That's 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 where I kind of was like, ah, I just don't feel it. But you know what? It's time to get to the hanging around Johnson segment because today we got my guy Tank Williams, Tank and I. If you see behind me, the Julius Peppers uh, nameplate, found that. Uh, we got the Bear back in the show, but those guys were with me from the start as a draft pick, doing all the stuff. Tank and I worked out together uh, in Alameda, California. Uh, we had the same agent, so we hung out all summer before the draft. We hung out all off season as well, or sorry, all summer after the draft. And we worked out all off season before the draft as well. Uh, we we hung out at a couple Super Bowls. So Tank's my guy, former Viking, uh, former Stanford Cardinal. So we got to talk to Tank because there's a lot going on in this coaching carousel with the Vikings and where they stand. And what does he think about Justin Jefferson and Kirk Cousins? We'll have to get to Tank on that. But remember, people, when you subscribe to Locked On Sports Minnesota, you're getting endless Viking talk, Vikings talk with local experts. Subscribe to the free Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast feed wherever you find your podcast and find all of our videos on the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channel. And we have a word from our sponsors. BetOnline.net, Ron. It is your fastest and easiest way to get sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. It's literally the number one place to go for all the odds, all the trends, every pro and amateur league, We track the NFL lines on this show every single day. Uh, The Vikings yesterday were favored by four against the Colts. Has it changed? Drum roll. No, it hasn't. They're still favored by four. Uh, Over-under is 48 and a half. That's a big one for Vikings-Colts on Saturday. Find that line. All the NFL lines, all the bowl game lines, all the NBA lines at betonline.net. Find it on your mobile device. It's where the game starts. And now it's time to hang with Ron Johnson. On today's Hang with Ron Johnson segment, I got a guy by the name of Tank Williams. For those that don't remember Tank Williams, went by Cleveland. A lot of people wouldn't know that. Just his friends, just the guys that train with him. The guys like to make fun of him, have fun with him. But Tank was, I mean, literally built like a tank, played safety for the Vikings, uh, Tennessee Titans. He and I played against each other. I have a picture of he and I, so at some point we'll get that up in the show uh, after we played the Titans. Uh, he and I take a picture together, so I have that. But uh, excited for Tank Williams to join me in the Hang on Ron Johnson segment. Tank, thanks for joining the show. Uh, man, it's it, it's been a minute, but it's always good to connect with old right. friends. Uh, I think we ran into each other a couple of times, like Super Bowls and other events like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, most recently, I think it was the Super Bowl in Minneapolis you came up for. Uh, but Tank, man, life after football, man. What have you been up to? Man, it's been a crazy ride. Uh, when- I got into commercial real estate. I worked in that realm for a little bit. I started my own residential development company. So I was building homes out here in California. And then I just really got that itch to get back involved with sports. And so I've been working with Yahoo ever since 2015. First started off doing fantasy football and then kind of branched into college football, a little bit of NFL coverage. I've been covering uh, sports betting uh, the past couple of years as well. So Man, just anything ball lately. And it uh, seems like ball is continuing to get better uh, as the years progress. So it's been exciting times, and especially this football season. Yeah, and talk about this football season, man. It, it's it's one of those seasons, for me at least, that feels weird. You know, the, 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 the normal uh, headhunters or top honchos 
uh, like the Buccaneers mm. and the Packers and some of they're not doing well. And, and there's always a turn in sports. We know that there's always a new sheriff in town. There's always a new, and it looks like right now it's the Eagles. You know, Jalen Hurts is getting it going, uh, getting it figured out. The Vikings at 10 and two are now the second team. You got the Dallas Cowboys who always kind of hang around. Uh, but but you play for the Minnesota Vikings and you were a part of, of, of that program. And when you look at a team like the Vikings making something simple like a coaching change because the defense hasn't gotten mm -hmm. much better. It's about the same, uh, but the offense haven't added any new pieces. Dalvin Cook, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, Kirk Cousins were all here. Christian Derisaw was here as a rookie last year, has had a chance to get better. Brian O'Neill in the offensive line was there. So nothing uh, changed for the most part. I mean, you do have a new kicker, new punter, but I don't think that's going to change the team. But Kevin O'Connell with a new mm -hmm. voice comes in, and now this team's 10-2. and two. Um, Do you think or, or what do you remember about coaching changes that can really help, you know, put a team over the hump? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on a lot of good things. So I'm going to just take it from a macro level and then just kind of zoom down a little bit. When you talk about that the NFL is kind of today where you have so much parity in the league, I believe that started – last year i mean no one expected the cincinnati Bengals to end up in the super bowl last year everybody always associated the cincinnati Bengals with being the bungles and then the nfl it's like you have to show me that you've changed it to actually believe it so the Bengals were the bungles until they became the Bengals and almost won the super bowl against the los angeles rams and i think that parody has carried over into this year as well where you see a lot of teams that were up and coming and a lot of times we want to just make people like overprove themselves versus seeing what they've done today and be like, hey, they're a really good football team. Like you've already stated, the Philadelphia Eagles, you had a guy like Jalen Hurts who came in and played as a young guy and showed that, you know, he can play in this league. And then the Eagles went around and put some pieces around him and made it to where he could be a successful quarterback. And they don't want to try to make him fit into this box. They built the box around what he does really well. And so right now he's flourishing. And that's where you kind of speak to the coaching change that you see. You have Nick Sirianni, who has adapted well to his quarterback and try to put him in the best situation to succeed. We've seen that with John Harbaugh. And then you have a guy like Kevin O'Connell, where he comes in. Actually, I was in New England with Kevin O'Connell. So he bounced around. And obviously, he studied under Sean McVay. And he has some experience with Kyle Shanahan. And those guys are really good at scheming up things that allow their best players to flourish. And that's what you see with Justin Jefferson. That's what you see with Kirk Cousins. That's what you see with Dalvin Cook. So the offense is clicking on all cylinders. Like you said, they need to get that defense together. Because the one thing they have to do is try to pare down those big plays, the big explosive plays, especially in the past game, if you want to try to win the championship. But as far as what they got going on the offensive side of the ball, they can compete with any team in the league. You know, and Kevin O'Connell, we know he's a good coach. He's a people manager. He, he's talked about that. But you you said that, New England, you play with – like, what kind of quarterback was he? We know he wasn't Tom Brady, but what kind of quarterback – what do you remember about Kevin O'Connell as a teammate and a quarterback? I mean, honestly, I was only up there for a cup of coffee, and I was injured most of the time. Uh, but I remember him just being a tall, rangy guy. I mean, he had a nice arm. But when you got Tom Brady on the roster, even though Brady was hurt at the time when I was there, you always watching Brady and just trying to see what he does. And I think the mm -hmm. one good thing that Kevin was able to do, you study underneath the Tom Brady during your time in New England. And then you have an opportunity to study under uh, Kyle Shanahan, under Sean McVay. And so you learn from some of the most – brilliant young minds in the NFL today. And then you just kind of adapt what you learn from them and make it true to yourself. And then you go and you implement that onto a team. And fortunately for him, he was able to land with the talented roster that all that was already in place. And so then he just kind of built on what they were already doing. They had some success. They just had a little bit of doubt. And then he just got that team chemistry where I feel like a lot of successful coaches in the NFL today it's more of like you're an associate with your players versus having like this dominating factor where it's like this, I'm the head coach, you're the players, you don't listen to what I say. Like you see with Mike uh, McDaniel and the relationship he has with Tua, you see the relationship that Sean McVay has with a lot of his players. I believe it's that type of synergy that allows coaches and players to have success in the NFL today. And Kevin O'Connor is showing that template can work up there in Minnesota as well. And talking about coaching, I mean, the college coaching carousel has started. Uh, Stanford's coach, who was my receivers coach, and David Shaw, you know, announced he's going to step down after this year. Uh, you see Luke Fickle go over to Wisconsin. Uh, you're, you're seeing Soderfield go over to Cincinnati. Uh, you got Dion Primetime Sanders going to Colorado. Yeah. And so when you look at all these coaching changes and coaching carousels, uh, NILs, for instance, they're saying now the NIL money at, at Colorado 
is through the roof. You know, 200 plus players in the portal have already reached out to Colorado to want to get a, you know, hey, coach, can you just look at my film? Can you look at, you know, what I did in college? Uh, you being a DB, former safety, if Deion Sanders was at Colorado and your coach was at Stanford, was leaving, would you consider, because I do know a Stanford DB, uh, Jimmy Wyrick, who I play with, his son, uh, I think started at safety the last like two years for Stanford. Um, if your coach was going to step down and leave Stanford, and I know it's more than just football, the degree there is huge from Stanford, but would you mm -hmm. consider going to play for Prime? Because Colorado is not too far, and Dion is about to turn that into a five-star like haven. Uh, you know, would a guy like yourself, would you want to go play for Deion Sanders? See, I think the that's an interesting question. I, I believe that if you're at most institutions and you're a defensive back and you have a coach that leaves and you have an opportunity to go play for Coach Prime, absolutely you go. Because I think the things that you can learn in the meeting room with Deion Sanders, as you know, like a lot of players who have played at the highest level, like it's just intricacies of but they understand that a lot of people don't. And being able to get that knowledge at such a young age is like transformable for uh, you in your career, especially if you're trying to make it to the next level. I think mm -hmm. that being said, I think if you're a player at Stanford, you have to look at it a little bit differently. I think that you always look at the entire, the everything that Stanford has to offer. I mean, it's not just about athletics, even though we've shown that we can put players like Andrew Luck, Richard Sherman, all these guys into the league. But it's also, if you don't make it to the league, all the other connections that you have in the business world and how you can kind of really set yourself up for life after football. And so I think in most places, a hire like Coach Prime makes the most sense because in the day of the transfer portal, in the day of the NIL, you want to have a high profile coach who can recruit and bring in resources, AKA talented football players from all over the country and have them clamoring to come play for you. I think the interesting dynamic is that you won't be able to compete with the transfer portal. I think if the play on the field is good, you can kind of get the NIL where it needs to be. So therefore you need to be able to recruit within and then highlight all the really good things that you can do at Stanford, get guys to the NFL. Yet at the same time, if that's not what you're trying to do, or if you don't make it to the NFL, you can go and be like one of the top professionals at all these different professions uh, in life. And so I think Stanford would be good to get a head coach to recruit and retain people and not have to put that transfer portal to use where a lot of other institutions need to rely on the transfer portal to get players in and out to try to compete for a national championship on a regular basis. And if I'm not mistaken, in that picture behind you is number 77. Is that Willie Howard? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Stanford? Yeah, so Willie mm -hmm. Howard, former Viking, you know, a friend of the show. Willie Howard coaches now in Minnesota at Cooper High School, so I have to make sure – uh, we tag him when we put this video up because, yeah, that's yeah, that's absolutely. We're just texting the other Howard day. He, he actually saw this picture. <laughs> I was doing like a, I was doing a TV hit. And he was like, I see you. I see you got me in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I noticed that. I'm like, wait, I, that 77 looked familiar. That looked like Willie Howard. Um, but when you mm -hmm. when you look at Stanford, you look at, uh, I mean, let's go to the, to the, to the final 14 because the Pac-10 right now, uh, didn't put or Pac-12 didn't put a, put a lot up, you know, as far yeah. as last minute play, uh, teams to stay in the in the championship playoff. But the Big Ten got two in there: Michigan, Ohio State. You got Georgia, of course, and then you like sneakingly somehow TCU managed to get in there. When you look at the Big Ten putting two teams in there, of course, everybody knows the Big Ten is top heavy. But where would you rank kind of the big? Because we know the SEC is SEC and it's kind of tough. But where would you put the Pac-12? in with like the Big 10 and the Big 12? It's interesting because I feel that before this year, I'd have had the EC like ahead. I would have the Big 10 like, you know, up there, but you know, a step below the SEC. And then a lot of other conferences probably like, I would say significantly, but like enough back because you can tell that there's like this big gap between the conferences. But the parity that we've seen in the SEC and the parity that we've seen in college football, it kind of resembles what we've seen in the NFL this year, where a lot of times you're not accustomed to seeing Alabama lose two games. I mean, we're not mm -hmm. used to seeing a team like Tennessee come out of woodwork and throw up points like they have against Alabama and LSU in Death Valley and things like that. And so I think that that mindset about the dominant teams in college football needs to change, especially when we're seeing what's going on between the white lines where 
you can have Ohio State get pushed to the limit by a Notre Dame team that got beat by my Stanford Cardinal team that's not that good. That's why David Shaw is leaving. You know what I'm saying? So I think you can look at some of these teams like a USC, the way that they beat Notre the season, the way that Ohio State played Notre Dame and say, hey, I think maybe some of these Pac-12 teams can actually line up and compete with the Big Ten, maybe line up and compete against the SEC. And I feel like we won't know that probably until we get that expanded playoff that's coming in a couple of years. And so I think a lot of people are anxious to see how that all plays out, where you have maybe a Pac-12 team that may be lower ranked, but you get an SEC school coming in and they're playing on their home field, how they may perform or how some of these teams play on a neutral field. But I think with the transfer portal, with NIL and all these good players moving around as frequently as they are, I think it's kind of leveling out college football right now. So it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out over the next few years. And when you look at the transfer portal, do you think that like the the because the grades matter at Stanford? Do you think that's going to hurt Stanford because a lot of players in the portal probably don't have the grades to get admitted into Stanford? Do you think that's a big part of the whole NIL not being able to get yeah. some of these borderline like really good athletes, but classroom maybe only a two whatever two eight two nine? Uh, do you think that's hurting Stanford? Yeah, that's why the transfer portal really doesn't exist for Stanford. I, I think I read somewhere that. SC was one of the top teams as far as having like transfers come in this past year. And I believe Stanford may have had one, something like that. It's just so tough to get students academically in the Stanford just off top, just coming out of high school, let alone trying to have someone transfer from another university and come into Stanford. So that's why I was saying that when they make this next hire, it needs to be someone that just, it, what Stanford is need to resonate with them through and through where they understand that you have to be able to recruit and make sure you retain these guys because you're not going to be able to pull from this school, pull from that school. You're able to show that you can win when you got guys like Andrew Luck, Richard Sherman, all these guys in, and you're competing in the top 10, top five of college football. You need to be able to recruit those players, keep them within the organization, keep them within the program, and excel that way versus trying to play the battle that everyone else is playing because you can't, you can't do that. You can't win that way at Stafford. And looking at the NIL, you know, and the way the programs are going, and then looking at the NFL, because some players are staying in college now because they're like, I'm making more in college because I might not make it to yeah. the NFL mm -hmm. and be the player that I want to be. Um, when, when you look at the businesses out there, do you think that college football becomes more of a safe haven for the four-year grad type kid that does have a big name for himself, especially quarterbacks that know they're not going to make it in the NFL? Um, can you see – that becoming something where Stanford maybe not to say lowers their expectations, but maybe says, hey, we'll create like a secondary schooling program to get some of these guys admitted in school because we can find a way to get them to graduate and then create additional revenue through X, Y and Z. Do you think there's a chance that'll ever happen? I mean, you can see maybe some other institutions kind of creating some structures like that to retain players and and kind of boost the profile of that program in that manner. But Stanford would never. Uh, ever just kind of lower the academic requirements in that school to to do something better in, in athletics. I mean, that just that's just not part of their priorities. That's nothing they stand for, and nothing nothing that they will ever stand for. Uh, and so, I mean, I, and I totally agree with that too. I mean, I know it makes it tougher for the the program to compete on a regular basis with some of the better teams in the right. country. Yet at the same time, I think what they have at Stanford is something special. And they've shown that you can have a model where you can have some of the smartest athletes come in and actually play at a high level. You may not be able to do it consistently like at Alabama or something like that, but you show that you can compete on a somewhat regular basis. So I think getting the right coach in that's willing to change offensive philosophy, able to recruit today's athletes, having the NIL in place, because I know a lot of athletes are going to look for that, but making sure that they understand all the great things that Stanford has to offer so they won't want to leave once they get there. But ultimately, what determines that is winning on the field, which is why you have to get a really good coach who can recruit in and then see if you can kind of up the program and get them out of the dumps where we've been the past few years. Yeah, and looking at the game, man, the game in the NFL, we're kind of transitioning to the NFL game. As a safety this past mm -hmm. weekend, uh, there was a lot of tweets because a lot of eyes were on the Sauce Gardner versus Justin Jefferson. And uh, Whitehead had a big hit on J.J. It was shoulder to shoulder. There was a little bit of helmet in there to the neck, but for the most part, shoulder to shoulder. And there was an unnecessary roughness flag thrown. Justin did catch a slant, didn't have time to get his feet down, took a big hit. But when we played, that was just a normal occurrence, trying to separate player from ball. Yeah. 
uh, with, with the today's game, and you were one of those players. You definitely ran in, you know, and tried to make a hit when you can. Uh, but when you think about today's game and how, I guess, handcuffed safeties are, do you ever see it going back to maybe finding a better way? Or do you think more and more this is going to become a passing league where, you know, you got to kind of take your time to get up and just bring a DB or bring a receiver to the ground and there's no more big hit that they ever want to see again? Yeah, what do you want to call it? The fantasy football league, the flag football league, <laughs> whatever it is, like it's here to stay. And I mean, you may see some pushback here and there on some of the skill positions, but I think the one trend that we've seen is that the fans, the players as well, and more importantly, the owners want to make sure that they have their prime assets out there for the playoff push and then obviously in the playoffs. That's why you see all the protection going on around the quarterbacks. Like we do not want to see injured quarterbacks late in the season or at any time because how much are they paying these quarterbacks now? Like it's about 40 mil a year right now. So that's why if you blowing the quarterback, they're throwing the flag. So that's not going to change. And I and I saw the hit that you were talking about in the game and just that's just the way it is right now like defenders understand that if a receiver is in a so-called defenseless position even though in that instance like the only way that he can make a play to try to separate the receiver from the ball is to try to stick his shoulder and it really wasn't a vicious hit it's just a mm -hmm. hit no. and it, it's, if anything makes the crowd go ooh these days then more than likely they're going right. to throw a flag which is unfortunate i like the fact that they're trying to protect players i like the trend that is going because it's going to elongate careers at the same time, they're just making it so difficult for defensive players to actually play and affect the game because there's really not much you can do from a physicality standpoint on defense to try to prevent the offensive players from executing their job. Let's talk about a player that you've watched, you've seen. Uh, I know you follow a lot of DBs, but Harrison Smith now leads all active players for interceptions uh, with, I think, 34. He got his 34th interception to start the game mm -hmm. off, kind of got the game started. Uh, but when you look at Harrison Smith, people are now saying future Hall of Famer with, you know, some of the stats he has, uh, not close to some of these greats like Paul, Paul Krause and some of these guys with their interceptions, but he's going to be up there in the top five when it's all said and done. Um, he's also a big hitter. We know that. Uh, but when you watch Harrison Smith play, uh, not say with reckless abandon, but it's almost like controlled chaos. He runs around, flies around. He's always making tackles, doesn't miss a lot. Uh, you know, kind of like a, he, he's a hawk back there in the back. But what makes a safety like that so good? Like what makes Harrison Smith so good that he's always around the ball and he's always making tackles? I mean, a lot of times people would think it's luck because the player is always around the ball, but it just shows that they're a student in the game. I'm pretty sure that he takes his craft very seriously. He's always studying tape. He's able to kind of read the way that offenses are lining up. So he sees formations, he has route recognition, and he understands what the offense is trying to do to a defense uh, when they're playing a certain defense, whether it's cover two man or cover two or cover three, and then he's getting himself in a proper situation to either make a play on the ball or try to give assistance to one of his fellow defenders. And if a ball pops up or something like that, he's going to be there to catch the deflection and make a play on it. So I think when you look at his stats, he'll definitely be in the conversation for possibly getting in the Hall of Fame. I know that there's so much more that goes into it. I know that there going to look at the way that the game is kind of trending more towards passing than it did before. And so I guess the DBs have so many more opportunities in today's NFL than they did in that past. But at the same time, you just can't take away how many times he's made a play on the ball and affected the game positively for his team. I think the one thing that really would really help him is the team having some success in the playoffs. I don't know if they necessarily yeah. need to win the Super Bowl. I think it would help. But having some success in the playoffs where he gets a little bit more name recognition because a guy like me, a guy like you, people who follow the game or people who are familiar with Minnesota know how good of a player he is. But I don't think he really has that national record to really help a player like him make it to the Hall of Fame. And I think that that's why you see a guy like John Lynch who actually has some decent stats, obviously not as good as Harrison, made it to a Super Bowl, and it was still tough for him to get in. But then once he became a GM for the San Francisco 49ers, and then they kind of made it to a Super Bowl, that kind of raised his level of recognition nationally, and then he was able to get in. So it'll be interesting to see once he's out and how he's viewed by the people who are voting. But I think that the way that he's played consistently at a high level and the stats mm -hmm. show that he deserves at least a conversation of getting into the Hall. 
And last one before we jump into the daily three, that's three questions, three minutes each. Sam's going to throw some questions at us. Got one more for you. Justin Jefferson is right now considered the best receiver in football. Every DB, when they're lining up, we know the Lions are getting ready for him. We know the, the Eagles hope maybe they get another shot him in the playoff. The Cowboys want another shot him in the playoffs. There's a lot of teams that are thinking, when we play the, the Vikings, we got to worry about Justin Jefferson. You as a former safety, if you're watching t- tape, and you're talking to your cornerbacks during the game, before the game. What in your mind is a safety? If you know you're cover two and Justin's on your side, or you know you're cover four, and you know Justin is, you know, you got to help on that inside if he crosses your face. What kind of mindset are you going into a game knowing you got to face Justin Jefferson? Man, it's funny because that reminds me uh, playing in Tennessee uh, with Samari Roll. And being a uh, being like a rookie safety, and like you know, you're practicing, prepare for games, and you know, if you're going against a receiver, that's a good receiver, but it's not one of the great ones. Like you know, we kind of go about our practice, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday practice, it's all the same, and then like nothing's out of ordinary. But I know they have some games where we about to play the Bengals and it's Chad Johnson, or we about to play mm-hmm. the Jaguars and it's Jimmy Smith, and like there's like the intensity kind of picks up a little bit. And you know, it's like they're just paying a little bit more attention to detail. And I think when you're playing against the great players, like everything kind of ratchets up a little bit. And you have to make sure that you're paying close attention to how their splits are in certain formations and what routes they're running from those splits and how this, how the cornerback wants you to provide help, whether it's cover to man, if you, based on the routes he likes to run, if he wants you to shade more inside, if he wants you to be outside, then he's going to take away the inside and things like that. And so I believe just having that attention to detail when you're playing a great player who you know that can make incredible contested catches, whether he's one-on-one or two people on him, or it doesn't really matter when you look at the play against the Buffalo Bills. Like, I still don't know how the hell he <laughs> came down with that catch. But that just shows you how great that dude is. And then for him to make that catch and then act like it was just something ordinary, and then he just went on back, right. and then they drove down the field, and they got a touchdown. I mean, just that kind of greatness is, is just unbelievable, man. And, and he's still, like, really young. He's still learning the position, I feel. And so I'm anxious to see how this dude continues to grow in that offense as well because I saw someone that I worked with noted on uh, social media that was saying like it's going to be fun to watch Justin Jefferson in the Cooper Cup role but like nah man like just watching Justin Jefferson in general is just such a joy to watch but then seeing how Kevin O'Connell can scheme him up against all these various defenses and people know he's going to get the ball yet he still mm-hmm. gets wide open and he flourishes like the dude is amazing and so it's going to be something special to watch him for the years to come that's for sure. Well, we got the Daily 3 coming up next. We're going to bring Sam Ekstrom in, my producer. But before we do that, you can now find Locked On Sports Minnesota on Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app to get all your favorite shows, all the videos. Just go to the TV, search Locked On Sports Minnesota, download it. You'll see all the shows. And, of course, wherever you get your podcast, you can also listen. And before we get to the Daily 3 with Tank, let me tell you about Built Bar and some of these unreal new flavors that they've thought up. Cookie dough topper, coconut brownie bar, coconut brownie topper. These wonderful flavors with 100% real chocolate. And then a couple twists for the holiday season. White chocolate peppermint granola and candy cane brownie puff. That last one, just I could eat eight of them at once. They're so good. Uh, If you haven't tried Built before, it's a great stocking stuffer. They're the best tasting protein bar on the market. And they're revolutionizing nutrition as we know it. They're high in protein, like 17 grams, and super low in calories, about 130. Sink your teeth into that first bite and change your life. No joke. You got to try these new Built Bars. Get 15% off your order right now by using the code LOCKEDON15 at Built.com. That's promo code LOCKEDON15 at Built.com. All right. It might be the Daily 2 because Ron kind of took my Harrison Smith Hall of Fame question, so we'll have to think of something else. But uh, let's start with this. I looked up the uh, the NFL pro football reference uh, game logs, and I, I discovered that you two played each other on November 24th, 2002. Ravens 13, Titans 12, the final score that day. I want both of your recollections of that game Tank, we'll start with you. What do you remember? You know, at first when you threw it out, I thought you were talking about the playoff game. And then I had to look back and I was like, oh, you're talking about that one regular season game. 
And so, I mean, I think one thing that stands out is that the only touchdown was scored was through a block punt. There were no offensive touchdowns scored. And then once I saw that, I remember the play because a lot of people will remember like Ed Reed for like always being back and picking off uh, interceptions and running back for touchdowns and stuff. But like this dude was a beast on punt block. And the one thing that made him so difficult to block is that Ed Reed is pigeon toed as hell. And so you never <laughs> knew which direction he was going. When he was like running up to you, he could break underneath, he could go around you. You had no clue because those toes was like pointed in like that. And it was like, oh man, which way is he going? And so I think that's the one thing that stands out to me is that Ed Reed was just a monster. And I think that was one of the, like, I'm pretty sure you probably made plays before that because that was like game maybe, what game was that in the season? That like game 10 or 11, something like that. But he was yeah, already making yeah, plays at that point. But then that just showed that how 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 he can affect the game, whether it's in special teams, on defense. Dude just went out there and made plays, and he made a play in order for the Ravens to win that game. Uh, I, I did have one catch. I, I'm pretty sure Tank hit me and kept trying to drive me back. Like, I'm holding on to the ball, and I'm pretty sure it was Tank because I remember somebody laughing like trying to trying to get the ball out <laughs> while I'm like going backwards. It was like a I think it was like a, a it was like a bunch set or something. I had the I had the hook. I think somebody else had something else. And so I hooked up, I catch it, I turn, I'm just tanking a couple like it was like three or four guys though. And I could hear him like laughing, trying to punch the ball out. And uh the only reason I remember that was a bad game for me, because I should have scored that game and I had a I had the under route and it was the rub route. One I think Todd Heap tight end went over the top and I had the underneath. Well, all week we were thinking they're going to chase Todd Heap. And for some reason, they didn't chase anybody. And it, they end up going like, man, but it was a mistake. And I stopped. I could have scored. I do remember that. But I do remember the punt return because I am celebrating with Ed after the pump block and he scores it. And like me, him, and Bart Scott are in the end zone celebrating. Uh, but 12 to 13, I did not realize the game was that low scoring. Because I know a game you're talking about the playoff game because they, I think they came back and then beat us in our own house. And they all like ran to the middle yeah. of the field. So. It is what it is. But the most memorable thing about that playoff game, though, is that we we're in the locker room and Jeff Fisher was like, all right, now the Ravens get a little bit out of hand before the game. They're going to play some music. <laughs> Ray Lewis is going to do something. Whatever you do, don't watch. Man, we got out there on that field. They started playing. <laughs> it's getting hot in here. All of yep, us was looking definitely. down there. Man, the fire started shooting up out of the tunnel, and then Ray came out there. He started doing this thing, and we, man, even we got hype. And then all the people in the fans were like, they're ready to pull out the fan, out the stadium onto the field, man. That was like one of the most live pregames I've ever seen. Just my man Ray just getting the hype before the game to, to uh, getting hot in here, man. That, that was crazy. <laughs> man, that was his thing. <laughs> all right, question number two. I want a prediction from both of you. We're 12 games into the regular season. I want who is going to play in the Super Bowl. You don't need to pick a winner, but you got to give me a matchup. So who's going to be in the game? Ron, you can go first. Oh, man, this is so hard to pick. Um, my early mind's telling me Eagles-Bills. Like, I feel like there's a Buffalo Bills-Eagles year. Uh, I think Josh Allen, I think he's finally going to get over the hump. Like we, we've seen him lose uh, before over and over again. We see Stefan Diggs standing there watching the confetti. The Chiefs have gotten their number. I feel like this is the year Stefan Diggs, the Buffalo Bills, you look at the running game now. If they can stay healthy, now that's the key, staying healthy. But I feel like the Bills, because the Chiefs don't look as strong, the Bengals don't look as strong. Like I do feel like this is the year for the Buffalo Bills to finally get over that threshold and maybe even win one for old Thurman Thomas and uh, Jim Kelly and all the guys that suffered through four <laughs> Super Bowl losses. Uh, but but I do feel like this is the year the Bills can make it. So I got to go Bills-Eagles because um, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to put the Vikings in it. Like, I just don't see a way past the Cowboys or the Eagles. Those are two tough teams. But I think the Eagles right now with Jalen Hurts late in the season, that run game, that run game in the winter is unbeatable because he doesn't have to throw to beat you. And I think that's the biggest difference. And that's where a, a team like Josh Allen can run the ball. Like Josh Allen can run the ball. They run jet sweeps. So that's why I feel like Pat Mahomes, if he ends up in having to go to Buffalo to play, that plays in the Buffalo's hands. So I'm going to go Buffalo and the Eagles. Yeah. So um, actually, I agree with you on the Eagles, because I feel that the one team that I was kind of considering early on was the San Francisco 49ers. 
uh, just based off that defense. And I think that their defense could overcome uh, some of the struggles that they can have on offense. And that was with Jimmy G at quarterback. But now that Jimmy G isn't there, even though Brock Purdy played okay last night, I just feel like they 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 probably wouldn't be able to overcome uh, two of the better teams that I feel are the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys. And the reason that I put the Eagles above the Cowboys is something similar that you said. I mean, when you kind of look at the stats, like everything kind of evens out. You know, the defense, the way they play, the way they intercept the ball, turn it over, the way they sack the opposing team. Uh, but what they are able to do on offense, especially with Jalen Hurts, how he can kind of take a game over with his legs, especially in inclement weather. Like, I feel that that really sets that team apart. And we already know that they got some dogs on the outside with A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, and Dallas Goddard will be back and healthy at that point. And that running game is strong with the backs as well. So I really like the Eagles. And then when I flip it to the AFC, man, the Bengals are interesting because for the past couple of weeks, they've been in revenge games. Like the Titans, where they knocked the Titans out, where they were the number one seed in the playoffs last year. Oh, man, we got three minutes, and we already went through that fast. I'm going to keep on going, though. Keep going. And then they keep had going. the Chiefs where they had the Chiefs where the uh, they beat the Chiefs two, twice last year. And the Bengals just don't give a damn about a team's revenge. Like, they went on ahead and handled that biz in Tennessee, and Kansas City came on the, to Cincinnati, and they beat them. And so I feel like they've shown that they can win without Joe Mixon. They've shown that they can win without Jamar Chase. And as they get healthy and get all those pieces back in place, the Bengals seem like they're on a mission. And I always feel like the Chiefs, mm -hmm. like they can be in it. I agree that the Buffalo Bills can be in it. We've already talked about the parity in the league where any team can get beat any given Sunday. But the swag and the confidence that the Cincinnati Bengals are playing with and having the ability to beat a lot of these teams who should have been able to exact some revenge on them like the Titans and mm -hmm. the Chiefs shows me that they're here to stay. All right. Yeah. Last question to, two, to replace oh, the Harrison okay. Smith question that Ron stole. <laughs> uh, Tank, I want you to give me a 2007 rookie Adrian Peterson story from your time with the Vikings. What's a, what's a Peterson memory from that year? I mean, it's the easy thing is to remember that game against, uh, at that time, San Diego Chargers. I mean, we all knew he was a beast coming in, and you could see it like in some of the first practices, like some of the things he was doing on the practice field, like this dude is going to be special. But then when he ran for like over 200 something yards against the Chargers and just dominated that game. And then you always see it on the highlights, but it looks so good in person, like where he kind of breaks through the hole. And then you can see like either the linebackers or defensive backs trying to chase him. And then he starts digging and his head like dips and you can just see him switching gears. Like that's my favorite memory of him because he runs so hard, but then he gets in the open field. You can just see him switching gears and speeding up. Man, that dude was something special to watch. And, like, when I always talk about some of the best players that I played with in the league, he's definitely right up there because that cat is something else. Yeah, for me, I don't know if I have a 2007 memory. I don't remember what year it was. But the one, because of my dad and the Steelers and the DBs and Tyrone Carter and all those guys that had ties to the Steelers, I don't remember who that was, but he put his foot in somebody's chest for the Steelers. Like, I think he, like, <laughs> ran them over, put his helmet in his chest, and then stepped on it. Like, just the brute, and, and I know he's talking about the, like the the head. Like once he gets going, and Will, he's doing the head William bob. Gay was the guy that he buried. Yes, yes. Uh, like that is like an absolute. He was a freight train. He was a gigantic human being. Um, I I do remember the the two hundred ninety six yard game as well. And the only reason I kept that one is because Jamal Lewis had run for 295 and then AP turned around and ran for 296. And so we were all like all the guys that were on the field blocking for Jamal Lewis, everybody that had a big block in his, you know, his big runs, we all ended up in Canton. And then we see like Adrian Peterson beat him by one yard. So literally you had guys, this is before Twitter, Twitter would have blew up. You had guys like reaching out to the NFL to protest. Like, hey, you guys got to watch that film because – one yard, I don't feel like he got that one yard. Like, you could just say they both got 295 because <laughs> one yard doesn't seem like enough to take the record. Like, that, that's that's too small of an amount when a ref could put the ball wrong, mark it wrong, his shoulder was down. Um, but, of course, it never worked. They gave Adrian Peterson the record at 296. So I remember that, too, because I was like, man, this kid just like – because I was a part of Jamal Lewis's 295, and I remember that day, like, it felt like he had entered the matrix. Like, there were some stiff arms where he didn't even look yeah. and just – reached back and stiffed arm Andre Davis, uh, linebacker for the for the Browns. And I'm like, how'd you even know he's back there? He's like, man, I didn't. He's like, I just was feeling it. And and Adrian Peterson, when I watched his, <laughs> I'm like, it was the same thing. 
Like he just entered the matrix where all of a sudden all the holes looked open. Every cutback was perfect. You know, all the lanes were there. Like when it was taking angles, he was hitting a different gear than those guys. So uh, that's, that's, that's the things that kind of stick out about old AP. Um, and it'd be interesting to see, like when the Hall of Fame stuff comes up, he's definitely your first ballot. But it'd be interesting to see like oh, where sure. people put him in the history of this whole mm -hmm. league. Well, I want to thank Tank for joining me on the Ron Johnson Show. I want to thank Sam for running. I want to thank Matt DeBritz back there producing on the keys, doing the ones and the twos. And also, I want everybody hey. to remember, we are a partner with CARE 11. You can catch us on care11.com. It has all the videos. Also, Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman run Superior Sports Talk. Check, check their show out. And like I said, Spotify, Apple, Amazon Fire, Roku, wherever you get your podcasts, Please download, like, comment, share. Let us know what you think. What is Tank Williams right? Are the Super Bowl, like, is the Super Bowl prediction right? Or do you think the Vikings are going to get in the Super Bowl this year, people? Because let us know what you think. Like, comment, share. Tell a friend. And have a great day.